There are two brothers uh, in the play. It's two-hander. Two brothers, Lincoln and Booth, um, African-American men, uh, you know, in their 30s, kind of. And um, one is a, a, a booster, He meaning he goes out and steals things, uh, uh, what do you call it, Shoplift it, shoplifts things, putting them under his coat and whatnot. And the other uh, gentleman is a, works as a Lincoln impersonator, but used to be, works as an Abraham Lincoln impersonator in an arcade where people come in and, and shoot him, as they did. I mean, it's complicated, it's too hard to, blah, blah, blah. Um, But so they, he works as a Lincoln impersonator, but he used to, throw cards, meaning he used to do three-card Monty, like the, the shell game, you know, but with cards, with playing cards. He used to do the throw cards on the street, and he was the best that ever lived. And he felt one day that he, uh, that was going to be his death, and so he, th he swore to never touch the cards again. And uh, the difficulty in the play is that he, he's remembering himself, basically. Oh, isn't that tidy? Sorry. <laughs> He's remembering himself. Um, he, he, through the course of the play, this uh, young man, this man uh, remembers who he is and what his calling is. And he is called to throw the cards again, and it proves to be very difficult for him. Um, and when he can, if he could just not remember who he really is and keep on impersonating Abraham Lincoln, yeah, it gets kind of sticky and complicated. But um, he would be all right but it's not enough. Was Adam reminded of who he was? You know, Adam, like the Adam in the Bible, Adam, was he reminded of who, is that what the snake did? Did the snake remind him of who he was? And so was he dragged down into his own humanity, into his own, what do you call it, mortality? Because that's what happens to Lincoln, this gentleman Lincoln in the Top Dog Underdog. He is reminded of his own self, which means he, that's right, because. Adam learned about, ate from the tree of life and learned about death, and that's what it is. He's reminded of himself, um, and so he moves from the historical into the, into life, and he, uh, anyway, I, I'm not, you know, I don't really think about, the, when I think about the play, then I start going, woo, but I don't really think about it that much. Their father named them Lincoln and Booth as part of a, a joke. It was a joke, and, and um, Lincoln's the older, the elder brother, and, and Booth is the younger, and their parents had a difficult, a very difficult relationship, um, and the brothers are pretty much on their own and have been on their own for a long, long time, and have sort of had to make their life, you know, just the two with just the two of them. But yeah, their father named them um, as part of a joke, yeah. What is it about Lincoln that that that? hooks me first it's his costume I mean and that's kind of that's not a reverend or diss in Lincoln you know what I'm saying it's his costume the hat the beard the height I mean and this is from a, a person who as a child was very drawn to mythic characters who you know the representation of so the hat the beard the height I think that that is um that has burned itself in the imagination of the universe in a very deep way. And if he, even if he had been just, uh, I don't know, you know, I mean, it, it ha and then the, uh, the other things around it, I think, um, I, I don't know, but I think that we can't dismiss that because all the world's a stage and the costume is very, very important. Yeah, so. Well, yes, and he freed the slaves, and whoa, you can imagine that. There they go, running free. Juneteenth was just a couple of days ago. Wow, amazing. Um, and, you know, he spoke in a high voice, though. That, that, that is always a little piece to the puzzle. It makes me go, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. How high was his voice? Like this? You know? Can you imagine a man that tall speaking like this? I mean, he was, uh, you know, they say uh, in some African countries that, you know, the dead speak in nasal tones. And I always find that fantastic that he had a high, you know, slightly, you know, anyway. And he was shot in a theater by an actor. <laughs> that's why I, I mean, that's what draws me to him, I think, a lot also. His costume, freed the slaves, that's icing on the gravy. Shot in a theater by an actor. I mean, how 
good is that? That if you're a playwright, like it doesn't just doesn't get any better than that. You have to, you know, you know. So I think that's another reason why he's he captures us. And these are things that we overlook in these sort of um, we list the things that we regurgitate the things that are listed in history books, and we forget these deep things. Uh, they're the same reasons why music affects us in a certain way. Yeah, you play a certain note and oh, you feel a certain way, right? We forget these kinds of things, these things that resonate that we can't quite quantify. That's one of them, that it's almost as if we or he knew his end, which is one of the deep, great things, which is why the Greeks loved to go to see, the, uh, to go see Oedipus. They knew the end. There's something deeply satisfying in that, like dawn or nightfall. You know where it's going, and there's something incredibly satisfying in the human structure that needs that and, and, and enjoys that. You know, he was the one who kept the country together, but part of his destiny was to be blown apart. And I think, and, and the costume and the hat and the theater and the thing, ah, oh, man, it's too good. But I think he knew. I think he knew he was part of the pageant. I think he got that. And that is why we connect with him. Do you, do you know what I mean? I mean, the same way, uh, the sa I mean, John Lennon, he, his costume wasn't quite as, as, as elaborate and dramatic and amazing. But I think he also knew that he was, had an awareness of himself as part of the pageant, you know. And I think that's why we're connect we, we connect to people like that, but definitely Lincoln, mm -hmm. you know. But you said it, you're right, I think you're totally right. But that's not the things that they wanted, you know what I mean? They think about, oh, talk about how he freed the slaves and stuff. Well, that was part of it. That was part of it. But it wasn't the deep thing. You know, it wasn't the deeper, bigger thing. Usually it's just like I can hear talking. Top Dog was like, I thought that if I looked up, I didn't as I was writing out because I wrote like, three days or 72 hours. People said, well, you wrote from this day to that, but it was like a three-day period. Um, ro 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 ro. And I thought if I looked up, I would see someone pouring silver liquid into the back of my head. That's what it felt like. It was just like, I know. It's, you know, again, that's one of those uh, bricks, those story bricks. Lesson from that is I'm not a three-day writer, though. <laughs> I just was once. We were hanging out at our house in Venice Beach, and I said to Paul, my husband, um, I'm going to write, a, and I talk in this voice, which is funny because maybe the nasal tone thing, oh, it gets kind of creepy. I'm going to write a play a night, and I'm going to call it 365 Days, 365 Plays. Wow! You know, and he, Paul, you know, he wears his sunglasses, shades, shades all the time because he's a blues musician. He's sitting on the couch like this, and he goes, yeah, baby, that'd be cool, like that. And in that, you know, I said, I'm going to do this, and he said, that'd be cool. There it began. I ran upstairs and started right then. It was the it was the thirteenth of November, two thousand three, I think, or maybe two thousand two. I can't remember. Anyway, two thousand two or two thousand three. And I wrote a play a day. The first one was called Start Here, which features uh, from the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna and Arjuna, and they're starting. They're beginning. And Arjuna, you know, the human, he's, ah, oh, you know, he doesn't really want to do it. He's scared, you know. And Krishna, the god, is saying, oh, come on. You know, I can hear them writing your name in the book and let us go forward and things like that. And every day after that, I just wrote a play a day. And, and now we're doing it in, gosh, it, uh, I think it's 14 or 15 different uh, networks in this country and abroad each with 52 theaters, each of these 14 or 15 networks around the globe, each have 52 theaters, and simultaneously they are doing the plays. So there's hundreds and hundreds of theaters. My producer, uh, co-producer, producer Bonnie Metzger, um, a genius at uh, bringing people together, and we are, we are so smiley about this. And we're charging a dollar a day for the plays. So as you, we're making just you know, hand over fist, no money. Um, <laughs> And we're having a ball. I just wanted to um, say thank you to uh, theater for, you know, for being, for being. I don't know. I wanted to say thank you, and the way I say thank you is by writing, you know, and the way I wanted to, I wanted to embrace the everyday, the everyday occurrence. I would wake up in the morning and say, oh, look, there's a rabbit running across the lawn, <laughs> hopping, I suppose. Oh, the, that play for the day is called Rabbit, you know, I, you know, for example. 
or perhaps uh, a writer or someone had died. I wake up in the morning and hear that Carol Shields, the wonderful writer, had died. And so there's a play for Carol Shields or Johnny Cash or Idi Amin. And th they would get their tribute plays. Or I'd wake up in the morning and think, oh, I want to write a, one of my project plays, I call them. So I write Project Ulysses or Project Macbeth or Project Tempest, you know, where we have sort of a... or. Oh, I think I'll write, oh, Hamlet, uh, Hamlet is a great play, and The Hamlet is a great novel by William, William Faulkner. Girl. Put them together and write Hamlet the Hamlet. And, you know, it was basically whatever. But the way I would embrace the whatever, the great, enormous whatever, is by writing. And I just wanted to say thank you. And that's the, I say thank you by writing. So, but the, the, yeah, so the, all this theater, these theaters coming together and the, the small theaters working with the large theaters and people going, oh my gosh, we can, for the first time we can cast, you know, uh, you know, uh, Latin American actors or, or Chicano actors, you know, because we can, we're, we're experimenting and we're having fun and we're, it's amazing. Sometimes they're done as curtain raisers. Sometimes they're done as little, like little um, features in the lobby while the, the while the folks are coming into a main stage production. Some uh, Seattle is actually doing the city of Seattle is doing a play a day. Every single day they are doing the play that was written on that day. So. And it rains a lot in Seattle. So, in, so a lot of the pictures that they have of the th play, they're doing it under a series of umbrellas. You know, it's, it's gorgeous. Each city is doing them in their own fashion as they choose because we really wanted the city to, the individual cities to take charge. In Washington, D.C., they're doing them. Uh, Atlanta, Chicago, nor the Northeast. They call it the storm front because it will, the show will move from Boston to Connecticut to, you know, it'll be, move like a, a storm front. You know, it's, people are having fun. But it doesn't make it any less like, wow, by saying, I can write a play day, and so can you, and so can you, and so can I, we all. Or, or, you know, a, or a poem. A lot of people said, I'm going to write a poem a day, you know, great. Or a lot of uh, folks coming up, younger writers, have said, I'm going to do it too, you know, great. You know, so they feel empowered. It doesn't make it any less special. You know, what's that saying in Zen meditation? Um, before enlightenment, uh, yeah, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood and carry water, you know. So it doesn't make it any less special. You know, we're just trying to say it's out there. It's available to everyone. It's something that, that everyone can do. We open up the window of opportunity in your mind. And we're not necessarily encouraging everybody to become a playwright, but we're encouraging everyone to open up the window of opportunity and see what happens. We tried to move at the end of every school year. So when it would, summertime, we'd move, which meant that we, every September we were the new kid in school. Um, that was often kind of hard, because you know, you have those weeks when you're standing there with your lunch tray and you're saying, mm, who will eat lunch with me? And you're waiting for someone to wave you over to your table, uh, their table, you know, and that, that was, that's kind of difficult. Um, but also, it's great to meet new people who live in different places, like, you know, from California to Texas to Germany, things like that. So it's a good, it's a, it's a, like most blessings, you know, it's a mixed blessing. I was born in Kentucky, so, born in Fort Knox. So we lived in Kentucky, we lived in Fort Knox, I think, uh, I was born there, and then uh, 1963, born in Fort Knox, and then we, my father got re uh, transferred or restationed, reassigned to Greensboro, North Carolina. So we moved right away. Um, one of the first earliest memories I have is being in the car, um, and they didn't have those car seats back then. So I do this because, you know, the, you, put, you uh, put the baby on the seat, you know? And there I was, like, riding on the seat, and I could see, like, sky trees, sky trees, sky trees, and that's the first memory I have into this day. As my husband will attest, I love riding in a car. It's very relaxing. I love going on, you know, on rides. Um, so, uh, but so I'm not from Kentucky. I think if, if I'm from anywhere, I'm actually from Texas. Um, when my dad was in Vietnam, he went. He had two tours of, of duty in Vietnam, and we, the family, because it was 1968, so it was a very volatile time in the United States. And my parents thought it would be best if the family relocated to Texas, where my mom's folks are from. So we spent uh, several years in West Texas, living in West Texas, while Dad was in Vietnam. And I really feel as if I'm from West Texas. That's where my heart is, I think. It was first grade and then, I think, or kindergarten and then, 
you know, you go to a different school, first grade, but you see some of the same people. We lived in the same house for a couple of years in a row. So, yeah, it was lovely, actually. I love, I love West Texas. Yay, West Texas. Odessa, yay. <laughs> Sorry, give a shout out to Odessa. But in the 70s, in the mid-70s, I remember we left on the day that Richard Nixon resigned. You know, so it was like, we're out of here. You know, <laughs> we were like, we're out of here. Um, going to Germany. Um, and my parents had this idea that was very far out, especially for the time and especially because we're an African-American family and we didn't speak any German. My parents thought it would be a great idea to send the kids to German school. So we were sent to German school where we, you know, they wanted us to be with the Germans and we lived on the economy, it was called, you know, with the Germans, you know, so we lived in a very, among pl the places we lived in Germany, a very small town, Höchst, that was uh, a thousand years old. It was celebrating its thousandth, you know, it's, uh, I forget what it was called in German, but celebrating its thousandth, thousandth anniversary. And um, we were in this German school, and certainly we were the only Americans in the school. We were certainly the only African Americans in the school. We were the, the only people of African descent that a lot of these children and adults had ever seen before. So there was a lot of, you know, wow, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of that. And then, you know, we didn't speak German. So there was a lot of, wow, oh, oh, you know, we, you know, and the kids um, were, because we were small, the kids were, the German kids were just learning English. So there was a lot of confusion. And then one day it was as if, you know, I could just, I just inhaled the language. It, I felt it actually just enter right through here. And I was completely fluent in German. And it was, it was great. <laughs> it was really great. But it entered through here. I don't know if all languages do that, but it did that for me. Thank God. Whew. I was a German literature major. I was an English and German literature major in college. I went to Mount Holyoke College, and I was a German literature major. And you know, every time I go back to Germany, it comes rushing back. Um, but I haven't, you know, I'm, that's about it, yeah. My mom, well, first thing that comes to my mind, my mother, who turned 70 this year, it's 2007, she tur just turned 70, she uh, has been, um, she's been a scholar and an academic all her life, um, but she um, is retiring from Syracuse University where she runs something called Students Offering Service, which is an organization which, that gets uh, the college kids kind of out of the classroom and into the community. She's big on getting out of the classroom and into the community to do things like crop walk and Habitat for Humanity and things like that. And, um, but what's exciting is she is retiring from SU and she's going back to school at Mount Holyoke College where she will be a Francis Perkins scholar. And she's all excited. <laughs> we're getting her a book bag and we're gonna drive her uh, up to Mount Holyoke. So she's gonna be a Francis Perkins scholar and, and study, what does she say she wants to study? Um, American studies and she might well take a dance class. Um, <laughs> So she's, so she's, she's, uh, yeah, she's, she's pretty out there. Uh, my father passed away three years ago, three years ago yesterday, actually, and is buried in Arlington. So we, uh, Paul and I, my husband and I visited him, uh, visited dad yesterday. He was a uh, tour in Korea and two tours in Vietnam. Yeah. yeah. And, th and then when he retired from the army, he g got his PhD and was a professor for, you know, 10, 20 years. His subject was uh, education, which I never, you know, it was always, Dad, what do you do with the Army? And it was always so complicated and mysterious. And then, Dad, what do you teach? You know, education. And I always thought that was like, I don't know, like I teach, learn, you know, how to learn. I uh, could never really understand. My father was uh, born and raised in Chicago. Very, 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 very poor family. Um, my mom from Texas. Um, not well to do, but certainly uh, her, her, her mother was a teacher, her g grandfather had a, a, a bunch of black businesses and did things in Odessa like build sidewalks and, you know, things like that. Um, but they weren't rich, but they were, you know, they, they understood the importance of education. But again, when they, they met in college at Southern University, which at that time was a segregated uh, college or, univer or s university, I suppose, in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So it was a segregated school. Um, so to say they were academic, you know, I meet people who are from academic families, and it kind of wasn't like that. It was just that I think my parents, um, 
recognized the importance of working hard and enjoyed school. You know, so, you know what I mean? So they weren't sort of these academics. They were more like hardworking people who enjoyed school and, and wanted us to enjoy school also. I mean, that's a, it's a, it's, it's just, there's, um, cause there was a sort of love of books and things like that as a, as was in the house. And instead of the sort of like, we are, you know, professors, they weren't, I mean, my, and my dad, most of his, m most of my growing up, you know, my dad was in the army, which is, you know, it's a totally different, it's not academic, you know, he was, he was a tank guy. I mean, he's six four and would be, a, you know, he would ride around in tanks. And I think, I don't know, I've never been in a tank, but when I would ask him, like, what was it like? He would always, you know, s you know, smile and kind of pull his knees up to his chin and smile. And that's kind of all he would say. And I realized that he had to sort of do this <laughs> for work. What do you do, Dad? You know, <laughs> that was, you know. So anyway. Back then, as I understand it, um, it, you know, it wasn't a popular war, and the public, we, the public, you know, the folk who didn't go, um, weren't uh, smart enough to know that um, the people who went over there had to be uh, respected. So there wasn't a lot of, like, talk about your experiences in the war. They weren't, you know, the, the men and women who served, uh, uh, you know, they didn't talk about it. But what I do know is that uh, it was kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. As he would often say, w before he went, I remember he would all he would wear his uniform when we went for, for example, from uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, to Greensboro, North Carolina, is a big stretch of land um, in the south. I say south because Kentucky's kind of people would debate whether it's in the south or not, but to me it is. Mint julep, Kentucky Derby. Slavery, it's in the South. So, but you know, not to be dissed or anything, but anyway, so it's a span of land, dangerous actually to travel in. So, when we did that trip when I was little and in the car and seeing sky trees, sky trees, sky trees, um, there was my mom had a shotgun in her lap and my dad had on his uniform. And this is how we traveled because the thought, the, the understanding was, or the, you know, they were told, you know, carry a gun in the car and, uh, you know, by the folks in the army, carry a gun in the car. If you're black and in the, in the south and traveling, carry a gun in the car, number one. Number two, the person in the service, usually it was the father, the man, wear your uniform. So, okay, so that was 1963. We were traveling, gun in the car, uniform on the man. When he came back from Vietnam, he got shit for wearing his uniform. You see what I mean? So before, you know, in 1963, you were protected because, say, for example, some unsavory character would see you and figure you must be all right because you're serving the country. And then in 1968, 1969, 1970, he got a lot of shit because he was wearing his uniform. So he, you know, he was, like he said, damned if you do, damned if you don't. He said that a lot in his life. So my favorite, you know, the ones that I still remember to this, Harriet the Spy, brilliant book, um, great pictures, uh, Hotel for Dogs, that's another uh, uh, often overlooked, that's an overlooked classic in my opinion. And I just looked on Amazon. I'm going to go and buy a copy for myself. I haven't read it since uh, the fourth grade and I'm going to reread it because I, I remember loving that book. And um, books with pictures generally are, are I'm quite fond of. Um, Oh, that, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name. They're these French people, Dulaires, D apostrophe U L A I R E S, something like that. I don't, anyway, Dulaires, we'll just say. Greek myths. Illustrated. The book used to be, I think it still is, about this big. And um, uh, I have it in hardcover, still do have it in hardcover. And it's Greek myths, you know. And I, my mom and dad got me that book in probably the third grade. And I have. I would sit there pouring over these myths. I'd lo I love tales and myths and, you know, legends, you know, that kind of thing. I used to love, still do, love that kind of, um, that kind of stuff, those t stories, you know, stories about, you know, gods and goddesses and all kinds of stuff. I love that. Those were my favorite books growing up, yeah. I tell my um, students or when I give my lectures, I use phrases like, you know, use shit for fuel, you know. 
uh, because sometimes something discouraging can be encouraging. It's all in how you take it. So when I was in high school, and this was, yeah, people have to understand this was back in the dark ages, back before we had things like spell check, you know. I was a very poor speller, still am actually. They, you know, they used to say, sound it out, you know, you couldn't spell something. They'd sound it out, sound it out. And having spoke in German fluently, you know, I mean, you can sound out in German and you'll figure out how to spell something, but in English, it doesn't work that way. So my teachers would say, sound it out, sound it out, and I'd say, you know, I had no clue. Very poor speller especially back in the day, and no spell check. And in AP English in high school, advanced placement English, because I just loved reading and books and things like that, loved writing. Uh, but this teacher would have us take weekly uh, spelling tests. I'm doing this, this column thing with my hand because there'd be a column of words every week. You know, we'd have to spell them. A column of words and then a blank, you know, or something like, or so, you know, so there's a column of words and I would remember this column. She'd probably give them to us on Monday and then we'd have to test on Friday. So I'd give them a column of words on Monday and then something. I, ah, oh, horrible grades. So when, when I went to her um, and uh, she said, you know, in that advisory thing that you do when you're about to graduate from high school, and she said, what would you, what are you thinking of studying in college, Miss Parks? And I. I said, ah, you know, I'm going to study uh, English, you know. I want to be a writer, you know. I was all excited, you know. Um, and she looked in her grade book and, you know, you know, I got all these Fs in spelling. And she said, you know, I don't think it would be a good idea for you to be a writer because you're such a poor speller. Probably not the advice one would give today because of spell check, but back in the day, that's that was the prevailing wisdom as they say. And I was brought up to say yes ma'am and no ma'am and yes sir, no sir, you know, respect of elders and whatnot. And so I said, yes ma'am, okay, well I'm not supposed to be a writer because I'm a poor speller. Fortunately I was really good in science and I was really good in physics. I used to ace my physics tests. So I thought, well, I'll just be, you know, a scientist. Um, but then, you know, what you love comes back to you. So um, I ended up in writing. This kind of story um, that kind of story has happened to me many, many times. There have been many people, not many, I would say, you know, seven. But since then, there have been many people in my career to d try to do that thing to me, you know. They try to like. And when I retell those stories, I do not mention who they are or the specifics because I'm not into dissing them. You know, well, you know, she said, you know, he said. I'm not into that because the story, the, for me, the importance of the story is how I or how one can respond when they're given some advice that doesn't jive with what's going on in their heart. You know, and that's what's important. So I haven't, you know, I don't, you know, I don't keep in contact with her because I don't keep in, you know, I don't keep in contact with many people just because um, moving around a lot, you don't really... It's odd. You don't develop the habit of keeping in contact with folks from your way back. Um, so, so uh, no. Talk but I wish her, you know, love. And you know, I know she was giving me the best advice that she had. You know what I mean? I know that. I know that. And it's how, again, it's how I take it. I did run into, though, a, a, young, a, a, a guy who is um, like a uh, fabulous career. He lives in, I think, Ohio, Cincinnati, I think, or maybe Cleveland, Cleveland. And he is a surgeon, brilliant uh, guy, was brilliant in high school. And I told the story, didn't mention the name of the teacher, and he was in the audience, and he came up to me afterwards. He looks the same. You know, he said, oh, my God, you look the same. I said, oh, my God, you do too. And he said, that teacher, she said the same thing to me. I think that was her thing that she said. If you weren't a great speller, you know, she was sending you into the other, you know, she was sending you out of the English department kind of thing. So, you know, it wasn't personal. It was just, yeah. I was in college, in the science lab, poor, you know, I think it was chemistry, you know, pouring the, doing the, you know, and chemistry's cool. It just wasn't my thing, you know. It's just like, oh, God, I, you know, it was dying. You know, you're wearing the rubber gloves or, and the rubber, th you know, everything's like rubber, <laughs> rubber boots. I don't know what you, but the, the, the thingy, the goggles you have to wear and the, you know, you're pouring that thing. I mean, I'm sure real chemistry is much more exciting, but when you're just starting out, you're pouring the thing into the thing and you're doing some experiment that's been done like a million times before and it's horrible. And I was dying. 
And we had to take at Mount Holyoke, you know, as often in many universities, there's these required, there are these required uh, classes. We had to take an English class. And I remember we read, uh, among the books we read, uh, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, which I still don't really, like, get, you know? I mean, yeah, right? But, but I got it, like, in a, this way. I was like, ah, oh, you know? Oh, this is beautiful. It was beautiful. A woman and the lighthouse, and will we go to the lighthouse? Will we not go? Will the weather be good? Whatever. I don't know what they're talking about, but it was gorgeous. And I remember when I read that book, I said, oh, yeah, I remember who I am. It reminded me. It re helped me remember, literally, put my members back on each other. You know, put my hand, like, this is someone who had given me my hands back or my eyes back, or my ears back, or my heart back. You remember yourself, and you go, I remember who I am. I am the kid who loves myths, and who loves to mix up songs about things, and who loves to, you know, uh, who loves writing. So there I was. I danced out of there, and I've been dancing out ever since. <laughs> I think a lot of people coming up these days, I mean, they, they, you know, what the news is, 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 is bad, you know, and it's kind of scary, or they're told that no matter how hard you work, you won't get a job because no one gets a job at a college. You know, they told all these kinds of things, and, and, but you just have to, like, stick to your guns and, and continue, continually remember yourself and continually be yourself. And what happens when you continually remind yourself of who you are, all kinds of wonderful things happen, like... Gee, you get a little note in the mail from your favorite English teacher who says, James Baldwin is going to be teaching a creative writing class. Would you like to apply? And you think, James Baldwin. Oh, my gosh. My parents had given me one of his, um, it was Go Tell It on the Mountain, I believe. When I was, a, a, when I was in, that's right, they found out, oh, you want to be a writer? I'm in the fourth grade saying, I want to write. I want to write a novel and stuff. So they give me a James Baldwin book when I'm very small. 1972. Ten years later, weird, in 1982, I'm in college and get this note in the mail from my favorite English teacher, Mary McHenry. James Baldwin's going to be teaching a creative writing class. Would you like to apply? And I thought, oh my gosh. Um, send in one of my short stories that I've been working on ever since I had reminded myself that I wanted to be a writer. And uh, I was accepted, and I was one of 15 people, which it was very competitive to get in because he taught in the five college consortium. Uh, you know, Mount Holyoke, Smith, Amherst, UMass, and Hampshire College. That's right. So he selected three from each college. So we were 15 folks. Yes, it was kind of, you know, it was kind of intense. 15 folks around the table, and he was at the head of the table. And just a such a generous and brilliant spirit, you know, such a great... Um, he really taught, I mean, he, he taught me how to, I tell folks, he taught me how to conduct myself in the presence of the Spirit. Um, he taught, yeah, he taught me how to conduct myself in the presence of the Spirit, meaning the Spirit is an honored guest and you welcome them in to your life when they knock on the door. And he, his whole life to me was about that. And he taught me that just by his example, just by sitting at the head of the table. He didn't teach us any writing tricks, you know. He didn't teach us how to network at these social functions. He taught us how to conduct ourselves in the presence of the Spirit. And um, he's a very generous, very generous teacher. It does have to do with having faith in your voice. It does. It, it, sticking to your guns, believing in yourself, realizing that yourself isn't Y O. Let me see if I can spell it right. Y O U R, little s e l f. It's not that. It's Y O U R S capital S E L F. Yourself includes everybody. You're part of the huge universal community at all times. Even when you meet somebody you don't like, who isn't like you. I was telling the the the, the uh, honor honor delegates today that uh, the concept of radical inclusion means you have to include even folks you don't like, which is hard. Um, having faith in yourself, having faith in your, in your own voice, things like working hard, you know. He didn't just, uh, he wasn't just sitting with his feet up on the desk. He was a hard-working writer. Um, service, the idea of service, the idea of being there for the people, you know, and not just maybe your own people, you know, African-American women under the age of 44, you know. <laughs> no, you know, your people are, are again, the entire people entire world.
Again, Y-O-U-R, capital S-E-L-F. You owe yourself, not just your small self, not just, as I often say, uh, the character that I am playing this round, the character called Susan Laurie Parks, <laughs> the character by the name of Susan Laurie Parks. Not, I don't owe just Susan Laurie Parks. I owe myself my great self, my big self. I mean, this, this, um, this tattoo, and if anybody speaks Hindi or reads and speaks Sanskrit, look around. <laughs> they'll, they'll, um, it says it's from the Yoga Sutras, Sutra number one, two, three. Uh, the sutras by Patanjali, and it says Ishvara Prana Dhanani Va, which basically means your life is an offering to God. Big S, your big self. So it's a love for for your big self, you know, and that's what discipline is. And you, it's it's just a devotion um, to the greater beautiful thing that allows us all to, like, you know, be here. Um, yeah, it sounds a little woo-woo, but, you know, basically, I mean, and it's manifested in me because I'm a writer. I get up every morning and I write, you know. I sit, as Paul knows, I sit, I have my notebook, I'm scribbling. Don't talk to me right now, honey, I'm writing. You know, that, that's, that's my thing. That's how I manifested a, a uh, I don't know, uh, someone who jump, runs the hurdles or a tennis player would manifest it in daily going out there and hitting balls or whatever they do. I'm not sure what they do. I'm a ham. I'm such a ham. I mean, I can't help it. I mean, <laughs> I'm a ham. Um, so when we sat at this beautiful table, this long table, and all 15 of us, the other writers, they would read their work, and they would read it as I suppose one should read a short story. You know, don't know, you know, beautifully voiced, <laughs> like that great, really, you know. Uh, but I would like, da -da -da, da -da, and sometimes I'd get up and, da -da -da, da -da -da -da. and you know, I did this week after week, and every time it was my turn, I would sort of become a little more animated. I felt that that's how it had to be read, you know, it had to be like lived, kind of. And after a couple of weeks, he said, um, he said, Miss Parks, have you ever thought about writing for the theater? You know, and I thought he was telling me, you know, you're no good, out of here, you know, go to the theater, like get thee to a nunnery. I didn't know what he, I was devastated. But then as I rode home on the, the bus, because the ha class was at Hampshire College, so I rode the bus home, I, I thought, well, maybe I'll start writing for the theater. I have no, knew nothing about theater, nothing. I mean, I knew what, a, you know, I'd seen a play or two, but hadn't taken a theater class at Mount Holyoke, anything like that. So I started writing for the theater. I'm still writing for the theater today. <laughs> That's what the, the interesting thing about these blocks of advice, you know. Sometimes the advice is very well meaning from a teacher who says, no way, you should not be a writer. Sometimes the advice is from a very well meaning teacher who says, you should try playwriting. It's, you have to know, and knowing yourself and listening to yourself and developing that practice of listening in to what it is that you want and who you are, it makes you better able to understand and decipher the advice. Some advice jives with you, some advice does not jive with you, and you have to learn to distinguish that, and that's difficult. It's a lifelong practice, um, lifelong, yeah. I had to take a, a secretarial course because I was not a fast typer. So I learned to type, you know, a million words a minute. It was amazing. But um, so I'd been doing that those those uh, day jobs, and writing, writing, writing at night, and writing my plays at night, and hanging out in various you know places, and um, volunteering my my work. You know, like I'll clean your help clean your theater. I said to one group of folks, just so I can be around you guys. You know, and that's you know I'll be you know on the janitor team kind. Of. I mean, and lots of young up and coming artists do that sort of thing. Um, didn't have a desire to go to graduate school because. I'd had um, James Baldwin as a teacher. I touched my forehead because it's like he gave me a kiss on the forehead. I had James Baldwin as a teacher, and I did not feel that I need to, to, needed to enroll in another academic program, but I needed to do the work. So I was doing the work, I'm going to theaters, checking out folks, and I saw. I went to one show, and I so uh, someone said I heard someone say, you know, Elisa Solomon something is here, or something like that. And I looked up, you know, I knew she was the very much esteemed critic from the uh, Village Voice. And I thought, and then as luck would have it, we were riding, we were both on the same train. It was an empty train car late at night. 
And I was, you know, I can look strange late at night in an empty train car. Little did I know she's a, she's a third degree black belt in karate. I didn't know this. <laughs> so she's at the other end of the car, and I'm like, oh, man, here's my chance. Desperation. You know, I go walking up to her. She does, you know, she, <laughs> little do I know, she's getting ready to like, hi Luckily, luckily she didn't hit me and allowed me to say, excuse me, you know, you're Lisa Solomon. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm a, I'm a desperate playwright. Where do I send my work? Um, she rattled off some places. She was very kind, very kind. Um, and we're still friends today, which is just, she's fantastic, one of these fantastic people in the theater. Um, but um, she gave me a list, and of course, being the, you know, okay, great, I had the list, I sent, placed every single one, one of them, Baca Downtown in Brooklyn, um, bore fruit, and they did, they ended up doing um, Imperceptible Mutabilities in the Third Kingdom, which won the Obie in 1990 for Best New American Play. So it was very wonderful. Don't be afraid to go up to someone who's maybe further along in their career than you are, um, and ask them for their advice. And again, and this is the kind of advice I mean, for example, I did not go up to her and say, hi, I'm a playwright, could you read my play? I didn't, I, I, because I knew better, <laughs> you know? I just said, where, you know, off the top of your head, do you have any advice, you know, that kind of thing. So realize, go up to approach these people with respect for their time, but do approach them, definitely, because we all ha will say, like, oh, do such and such, or whatever, like that. I was at a cocktail party. I heard someone talking about a woman named Sarti Bartman from the, uh, from the southern uh, region of Africa. Uh, was part of the, in the 1800s, uh, so the history tells us, she was part of the, what they call Hottentot or Khoisan peoples. Um, some of the women in the Khoisan peoples have, are distinguished by very large buttocks. And so she was taken to England and exhibited as a freak or as a curiosity, I think is, was the, the term they used. Um, so I heard people talking about this over at a cocktail party, and I thought, oh, wow, you know, I really want to um, write a play about her, or actually initially it was include her in a, a play, about, which is about a lot of people, included her in the play, and of course she took over uh, the play, and it became uh, all about her. N it's not a history play. Uh, it's not the history channel. It's a a play uh, about her and also about love. And there's, there are historical elements in it and there's a lot of fiction in it too. They're still doing the, I mean, everywhere I go, people come up to me, I was in, v I mean, <laughs> just in Chicago, I was in Chicago the other day, I was in Venus and I did, um, this young man, Ian, that's why I started talking, I'm sorry, was, uh, I nicknamed him Art Garfunkel, this kid, because he looks like Art Garfunkel, but his real name is Ian, I can't remember his last name in Chicago, he, I think, directed a production of Venus, and he was just telling me about, oh my God, it blew my mind. It, so it's been blowing minds, um, but some, sometimes people say, oh gee, you should have made her more, uh, more this and that and this and that, and I remind them that it's not the History Channel, it's a, it's a, it's a play, and she does have agency, you know, a lot of times they say, oh, you're making, you know, so they, they it, it, it stimulates a lot of conversation. But overwhelmingly, I think people who do the play and who see uh, the production of the play, it's very moving. It's very painful. It's a very painful, sad, difficult play um, it, because ultimately it's about love, which is a difficult subject if you really go in. I was in a canoe with a friend paddling along, and I said to the friend, I hollered up to the friend, I'm going to write a play, a riff on the Scarlet Letter, and I'm going to call it fucking A. Ha, ha, ha. And we laughed in the canoe. As we dragged the canoe back to shore, the idea had ho deeply hooked me. And I knew that I had to write a play, a riff on the Scarlet Letter called fucking A. Well, funny enough, I hadn't read the Scarlet Letter yet. I hadn't yet read the book. I just, you know, knew the story. And, um went home, read the book, and that became the long process of writing a play called Fucking A. I worked on it, draft, 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 rewrite, 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 for like four years, sat in front of my computer one day and said, this is not working. Threw out everything that wasn't working, threw out all the plot, all the story. It wasn't like the Scarlet Letter at all, at all. 
so throughout the plot, throughout all the characters, I got down to two things. One was the character name, a, a character named Hester, and one was the title fucking A. I threw out Hester, kept the title, and I heard a voice in my head. What about my play? And I said, you're not, Hester says, what about my play? I says, you're not in the, I, I'm cutting you because you don't work. It doesn't work. So I'm cutting everything, it doesn't work. She says, oh yes, 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 I have a play. And in five seconds, I had the whole story of a play. I knew it wasn't, that play wasn't called fucking A. I said, well, what's the name of your play? She said, In the Blood. I said, oh. So I wrote, the, very quickly was able to write the play, a play called In the Blood, which is about Hester La Negrita and her five children by five different fathers. She talks a lot about the hand of fate. Big hand coming down on me. It's a big hand coming down on her, the hand of fate. And after I wrote that play, then I was able to go back and write a play called Fucking A, which is about another woman named Hester, Hester Smith, who's an abortionist. And that play has songs in it and revenge. It's a revenge tragedy, that play. So, so I got two plays out of that. I think that I f the more I write, the more I feel that that's what my writing's all about. I don't have anything to say. You know, I don't have like a message, you know. I have nothing to say. I have things to show, and my writing all comes from listening. I just, you know, the more I can listen, the more I can write. You know, once I think I have something to say, and it's, oh, you know, bop, 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 it's over. You know, for me, I can't hear anything. I'm talking, because I'm talking. <laughs> People ask me, why do you write about Abraham Lincoln? You know, why do you choose Lincoln? They asked me, someone asked me the other day. And, and I said, I don't, I finally realized, I don't choose Lincoln. Lincoln chose, Lincoln chooses me. You know, it's a continual choosing, I, and I'm not sure why, but here I am. Um, yes, a, 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 the America play, which I, which was produced in New York initially uh, in 1994, a story about a, Lincoln impersonator, an African-American Lincoln impersonator, Abraham Lincoln impersonator. So it's about this guy who bore a strong resemblance to Abraham Lincoln. He says, I say it like he does, Lincoln. And he um, went out west and began to dig what uh, he called um, a replica of the great whole of history. So he was this digger, ha <laughs> ha joke, <laughs> and digging this hole, ha ha, it's a lot of silly jokes in that play, and um, digging this hole, and then in the second act, his family comes to look for him, because they haven't heard from him in ages, and they find his, you know, remains, um, but that was the first time that Lincoln chose me, it was literally as if the, he walked into the room, not, not the historical Lincoln, this other guy who this black guy who looked just like him walked into the room, sat down and started telling me there was once a man who bore strong resemblance to Abraham Lincoln and all I was doing was just writing down what he said. It was like, it was trippy. Yeah, but um, yeah, so that was in 1994-ish and then in 1999, I was hanging out with a friend of mine, uh, Emily Morse, a wonderful dramaturg uh, and uh, I was said to her, um, oh, I know what I'm gonna write about. Uh, two brothers, Lincoln and Booth, ba dum bum ha ha. We started laughing. Just like the canoe, fucking a, ha ha ha, it's always a joke. Not a funny joke, but a, 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 a joke with a hook. And I was hooked, I was hooked by the great fisherman. And um, I went home and, and wrote it quickly, and it was like, yeah, silver liquid in my head. They call you on the phone. At least they called me, yeah, they call you on the phone. The Pulitzer, they, I, they, they, I was with some people uh, at the public theater, and they just said, "Go sit in that room." I thought I was. They said, "Oh, you're gonna have a meeting with George Wolf," and I said, "Okay." So I, you know, and George is so busy, he's late, and you know, I'm sitting there going, "Oh, he's late," you know. And all of a sudden, someone came and said, "Go sit in that room. Wait in that room." And I'm like, oh, "Okay," you know. <laughs> so I went and waited in a room with a phone. At the phone rang. They said, "Pick up the phone," <laughs> and it was the Pulitzer people. And the MacArthur people were even weirder. They just called on the phone just at my house. And I just said, well, hi, who's this? <laughs> and I said, nah, you're shitting. Nah, you're kidding. Nah, nah, oh shit. Uh. And that was before the Pulitzer, so they had sort of 
they were giving me prizes, you know. The fine print of every prize you win, no matter for what, a gold medal in the Olympics or what doesn't matter, the fine print is that you're actually being summoned to spread um, kindness and compassion in the universe. That's actually what you're being called to do. So winning a Pulitzer is actually, I'm being called to spread kindness and compassion. So the, that's what the real burden, if you will, is about. It's not about writing. Writing is just, I think, what I, the task I've been given to do so I can do something, you know, while I'm actually being summoned continually to spread kindness and compassion. I think it's kind of a trick, you know. I think, I, I think the, the, the creator is, you know, you know, a trickster. All the time. All the time, I think, you know. Someone was telling me that um, uh, one of the, the folks with the Academy of Achievement was telling me how uh, Bishop, Bishop Desmond Tutu was cracking a joke, like a God knock-knock joke that was like a brilliant God knock-knock joke. And I'm thinking, I love that. I mean, she, and she, she said, oh, I don't want to tell you because I can't do the joke justice. But the fact that Bishop Desmond Tutu, who has seen and you know, witnessed difficulty, great difficulty, is telling knock-knock jokes, you know, um, it made me go, yeah, it's true. It's true that you can experience uh, difficulty. I mean, this difficulty I've experienced are not even, you know, comparable to what he's experienced, but you can experience difficulty in quote-unquote, you know, dark times um, and still have sort of a, you know, what can dare call, you know, the unbearable lightness of being. I have writer's block all the time, you know, and that, but I write anyway, you know. <laughs> you know, I have, you know, difficult days all the time, but I haul myself up and, you know, um, and I think that's very important. Some some folks think that that uh, if if you have some success in a field, that it's been easy street, you know, a level road all the time. You know, we can even look at people like you know Lance Armstrong. He has to ride up all those hills, man, to win his prizes. We all do, you know. And we're all like, you know, in the Tour de France every day, you know, like that. Um, we're all like that. And um, the the. the that you know, the folks coming up in the arts or in any kind of profession should know that we're all we're all all of us are climbing mountains every day. Um, yeah, I have writer's block all the time, but I write anyway, and I don't you know I don't mind like oh this is crap I don't care, I can make it better because I rewrite and then I make it better. Yeah, oh that's another thing. Yeah, for the people who are out there who are writers, um, write, and then rewrite. Don't do both at the same time, you know. But I usually write a draft from beginning to end. And then I rewrite the draft, so it's it's two different uh, um, two different uh, ways of working. Writing, uh, if we when you, I'm writing, it's as if I'm sitting in a in a garden like a jungle, where everything grows. And when I'm rewriting, I'm writing riding on a horse through a field, brandishing a beautiful sword, the sword of discrimination, not racial discrimination discernment, I suppose you call it, sort of discrimination. I'm brandishing this sword and there's music like Wagner playing. Dun, 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 and I'm cutting everything that doesn't belong, you know. So there's writing and there's rewriting. <laughs> I, I, you know, I enjoy both, I enjoy both, but yeah. For a year, yeah, I did, I did. So I could be a better writer. I didn't want to be an actor, but I wanted to be a, a, a better playwright. And I, th for some reason, I thought, that's the way to do it. You know, you study acting. Well, I'm a ham, so yeah, it helped me become more of a ham, a ham hawk. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it did. I think um, because instead of a, a, the kind of writer who's shy and, you know, doesn't like to read her work out loud, you know. I it, it it helped me become even more of a sort of outgoing type of writer, even though I'm, I'm not an outgoing person. I'm an outgoing public person. Acting's really for me. I mean, we have acting is tricky because I would always want to acknowledge the presence of the people <laughs> in the audience. So it was hard for me to pretend for an extended period of time that they weren't there. You know, as a writer, I, I was constantly like, you know, I could be all the people and I could, I, on stage, I could be in all places at once. So that was enough for my sort of, 
psyche. But as an actor, just to sort of, I would always want to look at the people. Like Shakespeare, one of my favorite writers, he was everywhere and nowhere at the same time. He was everywhere. I mean, when you look at his plays, the reason why I love his plays so much is there's not, usually in, in some plays, you know, you see one character who's the voice of the author, you know? In Shakespeare, there's no voice of the other. There's no one character on the, he's everywhere. He's in every character, which I think that's what I strive to do. I want to be in all the characters at the same time. Um, so it's different from acting where I think good acting is where you are your character only. And aware of the others, but I, I think, but I don't know much about acting. I only did it for a year, <laughs> so I'm not sure. Ray Charles Live, we're working on that. Uh, we, 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 uh, <laughs> I'm working on that. Um, we are going to premiere it in November, three days before 365 days, 365 plays closes. So on the 9th of November, that's the plan anyway, at Pasadena Playhouse, we will premiere that. And uh, the movie, a uh, movie called Cabrini Green, about Cabrini Green. And two plays and a novel and some songs. Those are my little things I'm doing. Yeah, but that is, it's all, you know, it'll, it'll all happen. <laughs> I play him for Paul. Hey, honey, how you like this? He's like, damn, girl, you're a folky. <laughs> That's easy. You gonna say that? You gonna say, "Oh, baby, you're a folky," because <laughs> I, you know, yeah, he does. So. But he's a great. I mean, he's Paul uh, is the best um, uh, ear to listen to my work. He's always the one I go to first, last, and in the middle. Read. I read everything to you. Nothing really goes out of the house without me saying, "Honey, you know, you gotta, you know, tell me what you think," and you give excellent feedback, like perfect. He does have a great ear and a great eye. He also have a great visual sense and a great like. What do you say? He says um, that don't that don't lay right. You know, it just doesn't. You know what I mean? So it has to like lay right. Also, oh, that your favorite thing you say though is that talent. The concept of talent is overrated. The concept of talent is overrated. The real gift is the gift of love. And so what happens is you fall in love with something, like you fall in love with an instrument, or you fall in love with a craft, like writing, or you fall in love with uh, the legal system and want to be a lawyer. So what happens is you fall in love with something, and you want to practice that something all the time. And then uh, hard work at it begets talent for it. And I just think that's pretty, pretty groovy, hun.